All right, so thank you guys all so much for joining us and for taking some time out tonight to listen to uh, Ed and I talk a little bit about what we're working on and what we know about how, ch how children learn math and science. We're gonna try uh, to not uh, move around too much, so I'll do a little part, then Ed will talk um, about some other issues. But I thought I would start by just saying a little bit about why I love math and science. Um, specifically, physics is my discipline. Well, this is elementary school, and I began by taking timed tests. And there were lots of them. There were lots and lots and lots of them. And I never passed one. In second grade, I stayed in for every single recess because I could not pass the time. I couldn't finish in time. I just didn't have the time to think. So that's not why I love math and science. <laughs> but why I, what happened to me in middle school was um, completely different. We started looking at algebraic expressions and the teacher said, well, you gotta subtract seven from both sides and then you'll know that x equals five. And I thought to myself, what? You can just willy-nilly subtract seven whenever you want? Can you subtract eight? What about 100? Bigger is better. How do you know to subtract seven? I really didn't, I was trying to figure it out. She said, oh, you don't subtract seven all the time, just this time, because that way you can get the x all by itself. You can solve for the mystery x, and you can know that x equals five. And I thought to myself, power. This is powerful. This is understanding. This makes sense. This was the first thing that ever made so much sense to me. And so I grabbed onto it, and I never let go. And uh, later on in college, I found this thing called physics, which was like math with glitter on top. And uh, <laughs> so, it's amazing how much things can make sense. But enough about me. What about you? We've got a problem for you. <laughs> so we wanted to start off by doing a short problem. Um, and does everyone have paper, pencil? As you may need it as well. So I'm going to read this problem out loud. Think about a moment. moment. There are two cups, one containing coffee, the other containing an equal amount of cream. I know we have a lot of educators, so we know a lot about coffee and cream. <laughs> a spoonful of the cream is put into the coffee, then a spoonful from that, <clears throat> from that cream cup is put into the coffee cup. Is there now more cream in the cup of coffee? More coffee in the cup of cream or equal amounts in each? Go. Understand the question? You take some coffee, put it in the cr cream, put it in the coffee, some co some of that mixture, put it back in the cream. Okay, stop! Booze, 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 booze! Time is up. Now. This isn't just to show you the pain I experienced when I was in elementary school. Um, do you think if I gave you more time, you could figure this out? It's a mix. Problem solving can be fun. Problem solving can be exciting. People generally really enjoy trying to figure out these kinds of problems. And unfortunately, something goes bad oftentimes in the school system. Maybe it's a timer. Maybe there's not enough opportunity to sense. Maybe we don't know what we're supposed to be doing in the classroom. And so things can go bad. And so what we want to talk about is how, what our model of learning is and then how things can go wrong. And then we'll like to move from there into some of the more recent movements that you've seen in education in efforts of improving education. So 
How do children learn math and science? Well, we start with disciplinary principles and practices. And um, these things, it's a small set of ideas and behaviors. These things define a community. I like to think about them as the cultural practices uh, of, of a community. So it could be the math community, the science community. In science, there's biology, there's physics. They're different. In physics, uh, variation is error. In biology, variation is the point of the study. And so these are principles. They're ideal. But then we are dealing in the classroom with all these experiences that the students bring in, that the teacher even brings in, experience-based notions. And these things, there's a coexistence, multiple, often contradictory voices, perspectives, motives, thought happening to a human being all the time, like what you're feeling right now. This stuff is the real stuff. And um, our job or our space to work as teachers is in this space. We have, this is our canvas in which we do our work. And what we hope to be able to do is to connect these things together. And you see that there's not just one arrow going up, because oftentimes we think as teachers that, OK, let's uh, figure out what these ideas these kids have, figure out their misconceptions, and get rid of those misconceptions so that we can build them towards the scientist disciplinary ideas. And yes, we do want to get there, but at the same time, we need to connect those principles to their experiences. So instead, we want to provide experiences, often shared experiences, where the students can not remove all the reality and beauty from them, but to extract a few things that are the same among them and make some models of, of the phenomena they're observing and ultimately move to principles. But at the same time, they need to connect the words, the symbols, the equations to their ex experiential understanding. So in science, we use if physics is particularly easy. For, it's, it's a particularly classroom-friendly uh, discipline because the students engage in focused observations, and, and they interpret evidence. And from that, they make these inferences and models that I was describing. And then they connect, they build out principles and practices and those connect and inform their next ideas. I'll show an example of this in a moment, but one of the, um, so the idea is that they build from these experiences, we help them focus these experiences, we help them extract from these experiences, and then we help them tie the fancy language and the fancy symbols to their own understanding. Now, how can this, this seem so easy? How does it go bad? Well, one way it goes bad is when we try to go bottomless in our teaching. Never a good idea. Um, what bottomless is, is when all you pay attention to is this top of the pyramid and not the bottom. And all you're thinking about are the disciplinary principles and practices. These things are not bound to experiences by definition. They're principles. I like to put a little suitcase on them because that's why they're so great. You can pack them up, and you're supposed to be able to move them around anywhere and apply them to any situation. That's why they're so powerful. We love them. But if they're the only thing you use in your classroom, then you end up doing things like this. Take this, F equal MA. Look at the arrows. Look where the arrows go. There's an arrow on the F, an arrow on the A, but not on the M. Oh, here's some more arrows. When we do electrostatics, the arrows actually come out of the dot, but not on top of Fs or Ms. There's some more arrows. You see, if we're going to be doing this Newtonian mechanics, the arrows come from the center of mass. OK, everybody got it? Good, because we're going to move on. And now we're going to move on to biology. Oh, how about a little chemistry? And that's what it feels like in a class that goes bottomless. And that's a lot of our class. We all do it. Every single one of us as a teacher goes bottomless more often than we should. It, it's. Um, what if you went topless? Um, that's also going on in our schools, and we also do it. This is like discovery learning and some misapplications of inquiry. And this is where we, we definitely have students exper experimenting and experiencing all the time. You hear a student say, when I kept pushing the cart, it got faster and faster. It's like, wow, that's a great, ob that's Newton's second law, the F equals MA that I showed you earlier, but it's a primitive version. It's not principalized yet. It's bound and contextualized in that experience that the student's having. In elementary schools, we often hear the students say, our boat held 16 pennies before it sink, sank. Did anybody else's hold more? Yes, ours held 17. Great. Now we're moving on to omnivores and herbivores. <laughs> um, and so, 
So with the topless instruction, the activities were tied to the students' experiences. We built, but we didn't, um, we didn't make that next step. We didn't go to that next point of general applicability. And so that's dangerous too. So easy for us to do because everybody in here who's taught knows that we've done it several times because um, this teaching business, filling up this spot here, it takes an enormous amount of concentration work in and outside of the classroom. Um, it is a challenge to help to build the students' hearts and minds through science, not in spite of it, but through it. And so that's kind of what we hope to do and what I hope to show you a little example of in a video uh, that we're going to look at pretty much right now. I want to apologize because nowadays with all these HDs, my videos are starting to look a little, how does one say, not HD. <laughs> so, um, but what we're going to talk about, these kids, many of you have taught with batteries and bulbs and light the bulb activity, which is always fun because it works almost every time. And I can use pretty much the same activity, whether I'm teaching second grade, which is what we're looking at here, fifth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade, or at the university. Uh, it's, e it's easy to use the same activity because many of these students, by the time they got to college, had only topless or bottomless instruction. Wow, look how much I couldn't even take a breath. <sighs> And uh, so that they never had a chance to really learn these concepts. So here's a battery and a bulb. And you ask people, you know, how would you like the bulb? And would this work? Many people feel that that's exactly what would work. And there's lots of good reasons, you know. Isn't that all you do? You look at a flashlight. There's lots of good experiences that go into that idea. But then you say, well, what about a wire? And so this is the way the students in the video finally made it work. You can see that there's a connection between the tip of the bulb and the battery. And there's a connection between the bottom of the battery and the side of the bulb. That side, really important. The kids in the video will also build this circuit. A circle is what they called it at first. And this one has a switch in it so they could turn the light on and off, which is also very cool. And so what I'd like you to look for in this video is, according to our model, this is Vygotsky's theory of concept formation that I've kind of repackaged. Um, but look for where these things are taking place. Um, again, you're just looking for the instances of this. These students are trying to light the bulb and figure out why it worked. Yeah. Okay, give me that thing. And then how do you do? Put the little pool. Just like, you, know, you kind of could. It gets hot. The wire gets hotter and hotter when we each put it on something. And they try many different things, as you can see. I'm just fast forwarding for the sake of time. Yeah. You don't need it, but if you want to try it, so see what you can do. We did it. This one for you. Can you get it? Well, if it's hot, that means it's, it's kind of working. Oh, so. Why don't we go through these? It works because you're touching the bottom. So when you take it, you just take that wire and put it to the side of the light bulb and hook it up. And maybe the wire from right there might be traveling over here and might be going to the wire and making it light up. And maybe going to the bottom of the light bulb. Great. It sounds like you have a good idea of what's happening. We're going to give you some new materials. And th these these take the power from the battery. Let's try to Where make it, it and it goes all the way until here to the light. Does it just stop there? Let's try to, let's try to put it up here now. Where does it go then? It goes to the light bulb. But then yeah, it's it in goes the down here and it goes right here. And then what does it do? It lights up. Turns light. And it stays right in the light? Oh, let's try to put it up here. Okay, try some of the things. Look at the light. We did it! So what's happening? Come on, put it on! See, look it! So it's a big circle still, isn't it? Yeah! We did it! We did it! We did it! No, it's okay. See, look it! Okay, then this too. Oh, then? Then we, then we have the thing to hold it? Yeah. Don't we have that thing to hold it? Then they draw for a while, and I'll just 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We did the one that had um um uh, before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Without the switch or with the switch? Without. Without. When, 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 when that's how we got oh, here. To show yeah. The what about you the guys? Please unhook your circuits. Okay. So um. So you saw a lot of different, I'm going to show another movie in just a moment, but you saw a, little, a bunch of different little parts of that process. The students were, they, they made it work. First of all, they mucked around a lot. Then they made it work. And then not only did they, they made it work a couple different ways, and then they moved certain elements of what they saw onto this other representational form, onto this dry erase board. They didn't draw the colors on the battery. They didn't draw the lightning bolt on the battery. They selected out elements of the activity that were critical for putting on that board. And you can see that they picked out. Well, you can't see that because it's not there. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the, you can't? OK, I can't from here. Uh, but anyway, that they picked out certain parts. Now I just want to watch a tiny part of the last part because we see they didn't make any principles. And now the students are going to give it a little attempt to model some of that phenomena. And you're only going to see three students talk, but the two models that are represented are representative of how the students, what the students were seeing in the class. So who could raise, who could raise your hand and tell me some things you've discovered about electricity so far? Can you hear that okay? Uh, it travels through and it, most stuff that's made out of uh, metal. And like wires, it's actually like little strings made out of metal mm -hmm. from the inside. So yeah. that's why it goes, travels through. So are, are there some things electricity doesn't travel through? Um, paper. Paper? Electricity needs to travel through. do that for a while. We could watch a lot of that. And then, um, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that um, they meet at the end, and then they even give even more power. Yeah, and they give even more power. That's what I'm saying. It is a circle, but the electricity doesn't go one way. I mean, you think some people are... Okay, that's... That's all I was passing through. And there's me and Helen Douglas, who is here today. Um, okay. And I'm just now pointing out the two models that the students have, this one and this one. And how can the powers combine? It's like the same power, but the different ways. Okay. Okay. Okay, I don't know if you could hear that that well, um, but uh, so there were two, three, mo two models, actually kind of three. One of the models said, look, the electricity has to go in one direction. Mm -hmm. The other guy said it has to go in two directions. The two direction guy and the Adams girl felt that um, if they went two directions, they would get stuck and then the light would go out. And then, um, and then, not the, yes, this guy, the, green, the guy in the green and her, thought that if, they, if it went two directions, the light would go out. The boy over here that was advocating for two directions said if it went in only one direction, 
because the, the electricity gets used up in the light bulb, it would stop. It needs to have a constant supply. And uh, both of those ideas are right, you see. If you're thinking from an energy perspective, you're absolutely correct. Some energy gets turned into heat and light. And so it does disappear from the circuit. It moves out into the surroundings. And so from an energy perspective, Charlie is very correct. From a current perspective, electrons flowing, these other two are absolutely correct. So here are these two ideas that are being brought, brought to the fore. And the student, the teacher has to make some quick decisions about what to do next. And this is the context that, um, that we're working in for um, helping these students move from principles, from, from experiments to principles. And I'll show you a little bit later that this really works. But now I think we'd like to turn a little bit and think about why, I mean, this does look a little bit different, especially if you saw this in the high school classroom, which we do exactly the same things, and in the college classroom, why is mathematics and science changing in this way? So Ed is going to talk about that. Or is it changing? <laughs> So the first thing I want to do is actually talk about kind of the philosophies that have shaped kind of changes uh, throughout history. Uh, the first one, or the first two at the top, one view, more may often be gained by proving one proposition in three different ways than by proving three propositions in the same way along that same view, save where absolutely necessary and where the need is felt by the student, ideas before definition or rules, right? And then we have the opposite kind of philosophy. Inductive learning was a sham. Um, the idea that a body of learning could evolve from a child's mind without actual instruction was all a cheat. People want to guess when, when those quotes are from. Just shout it out. Can't be wrong. Is the guess. Excellent. Right when Chautauqua was established right here, NEA in 1899. So these are things that have been going on and on and on for a very, very long time. People talk about, oh, this new way of thinking. This is not actually a new thing, right? So in some ways, we've tried to find a balance, um, but it's this fight over these different ways of thinking about how people learn that have shaped reform after reform after reform. Um, and so I'm going to use word problems to actually kind of review some of these history of reform in the United States. Um, oops, excuse me. There we go. Uh, so the uh, 1960s, we have a peasant sells a bag of potatoes for $10. His cost amounts to four-fifths of his selling price. What is his profit? And then we move to the 70s. A farmer sells a bag of potatoes, potatoes for $10. His costs are four-fifths of his selling price, i.e. $8. What is his profit? <laughs> We move to the 80s, and a farmer sells a, a bag of potatoes for $10. His production costs are $8. His profit is $2. Underline the word potatoes and discuss with your classmates. In the 1990s, a capitalist pig unjustly acquires $2 on a sack of potatoes. Analyze this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right. So many of you have been through this right, um, and seen this as well. And so it's it partly shows kind of the big idea, but it really comes from a place of saying, we actually do need to make change. We actually do need to think about how it is that we create more people who go into STEM. And so this is partly based on kind of differences uh, of the availability of people who are in STEM in the United States. So thinking about the percentage of bachelor's degrees in STEM in the United States, 31%. 31% of your college students are in STEM. In China, 51%. In Japan, 61%. So the idea that this math or science is something that only a few people do, right? Only some people can do. Your campuses with 61% of the people who are in STEM. And this is not MIT. This is in colleges, right? So part of that is related to this idea of who can do math and who can't do math. And I know many of you encounter that quite often. Uh, a former president of the Mathematics Association of America said, America, more than any other people, attribute success in mathematics to innate ability rather than to hard work, right? So related to that, uh, asking a group of parents, 
It's a question. People lend, <clears throat> excuse me, people tend to have the same amount of math ability. Parents in the United States were twice as likely than those from Taiwan to disagree. They disagreed that people had the same amount of math ability, twice as likely to. They're more likely to agree with your child was born with his or her mathematics ability, right? And so what's the problem with that? What happens if someone fails and it's about innate ability? Why try harder? It's my innate ability. Why do I need to try harder? If you're doing really well, why do you need to try harder? Because it's just innate ability that I'm doing well, right? So there's been a, a lot of work looking at how it is that we kind of change that idea, particularly here in the United States, where it is the most problem. Um, Carol Dweck has done a, a lot of work looking at this, trying to convince children that hard work makes you smarter. And what she found was that students, when you change that idea, will work harder and will have higher achievement. So part of this idea um, of reform, the new way of thinking about it is, of course, related to the Common Core. The common Core, a set of mathematical practices that we want people to engage in and content that we want to engage in. Um, there's plus and minuses that you can argue. I'm not talking about the testing of it. I'm actually just talking about the actual principles. Um, typically, parents, when I talk to parents, they tell me a few things. One, my son brought home this Common Core problem and and then blah, blah, blah. Um, this new Common Core textbook, blah, 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 blah. And I have to take a step back and first say that there actually isn't anything called a Common Core problem or a Common Core textbook. <laughs> there is a set of standards saying we want people to learn that. And to emphasize that, how many of you have heard of Singapore math? How many of you have heard of everyday math? OK, quite different. Right? Really quite different in philosophy. One with the Common Core stamp, the other with the Common Core stamp, right? So these, the idea that there's a textbook that represents Common Core um, is actually problematic, right? So these are standards. How are you going to get to that standard is something that is up to administrators and teachers uh, and parents to actually to address. The other big thing related to this is the quote, in my day, we were the best in math because students had to learn their times tables or their long division or whatever algorithm, et cetera. And again, I have to say, let's come back to reality of in 1964, 12 countries participated in the first international assessment of math. So that was a precursor to the TIMS. Those were familiar. The United States was number 11 <laughs> of 12. This was 1964, right? So when you see this kind of backlash towards reform and blaming the reform, right, for where we are kind of in the middle, um, it's problematic to be thinking in that way. Um, we have actually been growing a lot over the years. Other countries have also, particularly England, who used to be really low, uh, doing much better. Finland dropped a little bit. Um, but there's also some problems, right? Uh, we wanted to make sure that we looked at international Benchmarks, right? What are these other countries doing? How are we going to beat them if we're not benchmarking against these other countries, right? And that makes sense, you know, uh, mostly makes sense, but there's also some complexity related to that, right? So those of you who are really familiar with kindergarten curriculum, right, the counting 1 to 100, uh, 0 to 100 is a really big part, common core now. Um, and that is something you'll see Japanese students, um, Chinese students doing from a very early age. But our languages are different. Our number systems, our, our um, number words are very different. So in English, one, two, three, four, but once you get to 10, you have a new set of words, 11, 12, 13, 14 going through, and then you have 20, 30, 40, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the structure of the Japanese language, and these are just direct translations, you get to 10, you say 10, one. You say 10, two, 10, three. You get to 22, two, 10, two all the way through. So 10 words will get you all the way to 100. So benchmarking internationally is a little bit more problematic um, in some areas than others as well. Um, now, there's something that I do love about the Common Core is all those practices. And I'll say a little bit about why that is. Um, I, people who know me really well and know how I learn will tell you there's a couple things I can't do. I can't keep a lot of things in my head at the same time. Can't keep a lot of numbers. I'm going to the bar, and they say, get me this drink, this drink, this drink. I can remember 
Rum and Coke? I can't remember the rest. I just can't. That's how my brain works. I also have issues with recall, right? Trying to I can work things out, but recall, recalling stuff is really hard for me. That's just how my brain works. And so it's always been like that. I've always had that issue, right? And so you might ask, how it is that someone falls in love with mathematics who's not great with recall, right? Doesn't hold his numbers in his head really well. And part of it is, I love the problem solve. That's what I loved about the Common Core is that it made that really, really important. I love that, and anything problem solving. Things like math problems, but like games. If you're traveling with me, I can figure out how we can get to Rome in a very quick amount of time and have enough time to get back. I love that stuff. Recently, I bought a sofa. And it's hard to see here. I didn't plan to buy that sofa, but it was on sale at Ikea. I problem solved. I figured out how to get it into my VW. Okay? <laughs> that is problem solving. I'm not quite as good as this guy who has like this whole whatever, but I love to problem solve. And that became such an important part uh, of what I do. And one of the things that became interesting also was to think how differently people problem solve informally and formally. And so uh, much of my research has been looking at that relationship. So I studied a religious, religious families that gave 10% to their church and the mathematics that they were using, the problem solving they were doing to try and figure out how much to give to their church. We call it tithing. Uh, some of you are familiar with the term. I looked at children shopping before and after school um, and bargaining with each other, trying to figure out how they're going to uh, buy enough items as well. I looked at uh, how teachers in professional development I had uh, developed were making links between their students learning in and out, outside of school again. So this kind of problem solving in the informal became very, very important. I'll just give you a, a little bit of sample of this. This is a group, uh, this is actually a daughter of actually a very prominent church member. And um, I asked her in the context of tithing, giving to the church, and in a general context to solve this problem. So at the beginning, okay, cool. Now let's say you had $22 and we're tithing. How much would you give to the bishop? She says, $2.20. $2.20. How'd you figure that out? I said, um, well, first I just did $2 or 20, which would be $2, and then the two for the 22, and you just add that, so it'd be $2.20. It's great, right? Then later in the same interview, I asked, I put this paper down, Point one times two, three, ask her to read it. She said, so can you read this problem to me? One tenth times two, three, uh, 23. Okay, can you figure out the answer to the problem? She says, point two, three, which should be 2.3, of course. Point two, three, how'd you figure that out? Um, well, when you multiply it, you pretend the decimal doesn't exist, or no, yeah, then you multiply it, then you just add the decimal when you're done. So this is a student who is problem solving in this context of tithing, in her religious uh, practice, and wasn't it linking it to that suitcase, right, that um, Valerie was talking about before. So this is what I study, trying to understand how we can actually make those connections between uh, the bottom and the top. So this is related to kind of a long history, um, going back to Vygotsky as well, of things that actually help people learn, that actually help them think about things. And so an old task that people used to do is these color chips, memory tasks, right? And you have two colors the subject can't use, and you can only say them once, right? And they can use the chips to help them um, or not. So what color is the chair? Blue. What color is the pencil? Yellow. And the sky? Blue. Oop. And they'll say, oh, OK. So they ask uh, students using chips and then without the chips as well and compare the difference. Now, for this slide, the important thing to look at is just the difference. The difference between when they had chips and didn't have chips and this age group. Big thing you notice, not a big difference with the little ones, right? Not a big difference, but a lot of difference between the eight, nine, and 10, 13 year olds, right? So the five to six year olds are too young to actually even use the chips in a way that are gonna really help them, right? And the 22 to 27 year olds are ones where they can actually picture the chips in the head. That's what we actually do, right? So we've moved these kind of uh, tools into our head and done them mentally to help us. So some of the things that we now see related to these new reforms that, doesn't, that look weird are things that are actually supposed to work like color chips, right? They're supposed to be things that are gonna help us get to answers, um, that we can actually think about them uh, very differently, right? So there's a group of folks um, that at the Freudenthal Institute for many years have been actually thinking about this. You will see this 
very related to the kind of triangle that you saw before. The experience down below and this very formal notation at the top. And I just want to point this out because we have uh, Fort Hall Institute USA directors right here at CU. So it's a great opportunity to be thinking about how people have been making these connections um, between the formal and the informal. And here's an example. Tools to connect. So starting off with something that's kind of real. Tug of war. You've got some oxen and some horses, right? And you've got an elephant, and they're tugging. And you want to actually be thinking about, in this informal way, how they can think about things that will eventually lead to expressions. So substituting that elephant for that, and then thinking about, OK, there's five horses. This is definitely going to be better. And then later, moving to a more uh, the expressions that we know, right? Um, and being able to do the very same things. But being able to have that real life thing to hold on to before they're going in and trying to do it all abstractly. Okay. For me, personally, because I'm all about uh, everyday practice and thinking about it, of course, I would have used some football players pulling. But there wouldn't have been enough room for all the Raiders helmets that we needed for just that one <laughs> Broncos helmet. So in this last part, I want you to be thinking about this tool. So I'm going to show you a number. I want you to solve it in your head, right? We'll just do it quickly in your head, and then we'll walk you through why I did that. OK, so the number is, sorry, it's 98 plus 8 in your head. Solve it. OK, so hopefully we all came up with 106. Wonderful. Thank you, class. Um, so there's. One way we could have solved it was using the standard algorithm. 98 plus 8, 8 plus 8 is 16. We carry the 1. We don't use that term anymore. 1 plus 9 equals 10. We bring it down. How many of you actually pictured in your head the algorithm? Very few of you. How many of you did something like this, one of these two? 98 plus 2 is about 100. That's 6 left. Since we used 2 from the 8, that's 106. Or 98, that's about 100. 100 plus 80 is 108. But since it's 98, not 100, I take away 2, it's 106. Sort of, you kind of went to 100 and just quickly did it. How many kind of did it? Some way related to it. Most of you. Most of you. So what I, what I like to communicate to people is that when you see these new funky, we call these open number lines for those of you who teach older folks who don't use that open number line. It's because these are the color chips. These are the color chips that help children think about doing things like that. It's not just to get the answer. And so people will look at it and say, oh, I did all this and that. Oh, I looked at my kids' homework and they're doing whatever and they could have just added it up. But even adults mostly didn't use that in their head. They used a color chip um, as well. I'm going to pass it back over to Val. So uh, in math and science, all of the, the, the reforms, the reforms that have been taking place since, uh, um, you know, the early 1800s, the late, mid to late 1800s, are focused on trying to really help those students connect where they currently are, you know, to some more formalized language and to connect the formalized language and symbols to where they already are. And we have a lot, we're getting a little bit better at it. But the truth of the matter is, you know, this is just a quick from the science literature. 1889 to 1902 was the Hall Descriptive List. Those students have to actually be engaged in scientific inquiry in the classroom. Uh, in 1906, 1915, it was the new, the new movement for physics teachers. And the idea was that um, student, we had to stop lecturing so much. We're, all we're doing is lecturing. Uh, reports came out, um, at the post-Sputnik era, we're at risk, and we made new reforms. And now we have a, never before has it been so urgent in the national dialogue that things are urgent. And so we have, um, I mean, they're urgent. And so uh, we have now three sets of science standards, um, all that contain some similar stuff you know, with every single one attempting a little harder to help the teacher in the classroom do the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Um, it's so challenging, though, and to be conveying it through a book or by stamping a textbook is, isn't doing quite the job. And so we're working really hard to try to provide these experiences for students to help them connect the formal language and symbols to their own experiences and to build their own experiences into formalities. We want concepts. We want problem solving. 
We want practices. We want everyday connection to everyday. We've always wanted these things. And it's just so very challenging to get it. The, the good news is, is that there are people working very, very hard, most of you guys. And uh, we have experts. We have some of the leading experts in learning theory, in curriculum development, and in educational change in the School of Education at CU. And we're all working extremely hard to try to solve some of these problems. And we're making some progress. And that's the good news. So some of the things that look different, that may look different to you, uh, as you're working with your, your, your student or your child, is um, that they're expected, students are expected to engage in sense making, not answer making. We're interested in how they're making sense. Um, they're expected to express their current ways of thinking, regardless of correctness. Oh, yes, we want correctness. But it can't be correct right away. They're learning stuff. And uh, they're starting from where they are. Sort of understanding is, is valued over memorizing correct terms. Cor these days, having the correct answer, matter is anything that has weight and takes up space, is not enough. We can't allow that in our classrooms. We have to, matter is stuff, man, is a lot better. <laughs> it's called learning. It's not called knowing. We would all be out of business if it was called knowing. So we have to be providing this space. Uh, the purpose of questioning, for our questioning our students, is to support them in that sense-making process rather than to force a correct answer. And so these are different from what we're used to. You know, we're more used to seeing, um, we're more used to people saying things like waiting for the right answer to come out and then hailing the friction. Uh, parents' roles are a little bit different. You know, we're asking, does this make sense? If not, what doesn't smell right? What doesn't feel right to you? These students, you saw these second graders. They're talking about whether the current goes this way or this way in order to light a bulb. They're, 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 we're all capable of this level of thinking. Uh, understanding that learning takes in a lot of time. And uh, it's OK. You can't understand it right. None of us do. Uh, I think I have to relearn everything most of the time. Ask your child to try to solve a problem in many, many different ways. We saw the ch children in the video. They had multiple representational opportunities in order to really, and I, we had a lot of them in the slideshow as well. Um, be comfortable. This is the hard one for teachers, is to be com comfortable with the discomfort and the awkwardness of learning. OK, learning looks awkward. It's not comfortable for anyone. You ever watch, you've all watched a kid learn how to walk. I mean, it's. It's ugly. And, uh, and then they fall. Um, and, uh, but this is what learning looks like. And you have to let them try. Um, there's, you can request parent portals. These teachers and parents should discuss this, that there are textbooks have parent portals to help you work with your student, your child. Um, understanding the content the best you can is very helpful. For example, in that classroom with the elementary kids, you know, knowing the physics made it easy to automatically see He's got an energy idea. He's burning energy in that bulb. He's got, that's a good idea. Versus, oh, these two are using current ideas. I can work with those. Which direction am I going to take? I have to decide quick. And, uh, but that content knowledge really, really helps a lot. Uh, understand that in math and science, authority is not with the teacher or with the text. It's with the amount of sense you can make given the evidence that you have and, uh, and with the consensus of the class. And that's, that's what counts as authority. So we should not uh, finish off. I'll show you a little more data after I give you this, my solution to the coffee problem, which might not even be right, because um, this is the way I did it. And I haven't checked with the authorities, but I don't care, because it makes sense to me. So um, the way I did it is there's cream, and then there's coffee. In the cream, you know, I started thinking, OK, 1 16th is a spoonful. And I thought, you know what? Let me just take a big old spoon and take half the stuff. So I'm going to take half the cream over to the coffee. And then I have cream and coffee. But now i got to mix it up equally before I move some back, because now i got to move a whole spoonful back. And so here it goes. OK, so now I can see that I have, well, I'm going to talk six now, because I've got all these pieces that I have to deal with. So I've got four sixths cream and two sixths coffee in the cream cup, 
and four-sixths coffee and two-sixths cream in the cream cup. So there's the same amount of each in the other <laughs> is the answer. And then, of course, beautifully, they both are still one cup of coffee. So um, it's a fun problem. It's a lot easier than it looks at first. Some of you may have experienced a little panic, um, and some of you may have just wanted to solve it. Um, but, but these things should be palatable, and they should be comfortable. And we can do that. We can make it comfortable for our students. Also, as teachers, as we learn, this space is for us you know, to, to experiment with our own classrooms and to develop the disciplinary principles and practices of teaching. What are the best practices which we could develop from our own work? I just want to leave by providing some evidence that this kind of methodology is useful. This is a high school physics class. It's an urban school in Colorado and um, learning physics in the way that you just saw with the elementary kids even and the stuff that, uh, the very similar methodologies that Ed was describing. In this class, the average normalized gain, which means how much they learned that they did not already know, um, was highest for the female students who were learning English. So um, these are usually the most underrepresented students in physics, and these ones were outperform everybody in a class that required, that built on their own knowledge and makes sure that they require evidence. The rest of the class, their gain was around um, 53, and in university, the gain is about four or less on a similar curriculum, a similar content, I mean. And also, they were supporting their claims with evidence. These are the scientific practices. You make a claim, and you support it with evidence. And that's our big practice. And over time, in this class, while they made the same amount of claims, the electricity goes in one direction. The electricity goes in two directions. They made claims. Electricity has to go through metal. Um, but they increasingly supported them with actual evidence from their observation, which is one of the primary scientific practices that is promoted in the um, Next Generation Science Standards. So students, they know what's going on. These students who have these opportunities say things like, we used to be gullible before this class. We took the information from the teacher and we're like, I guess, OK, or I guess so. But now we're expected to have evidence. We've become more in control of our education and in the choices we make and in the information we are taking in. We've become more open to the idea that we are in charge. We are not going to sit around anymore and just have an OK explanation. We're just not going to settle anymore. And neither should you. Thank you very much. Thank you.